All right, we're continuing on in chapter one. As soon as the Earth's crust cooled enough, the rains began to fall. Never have there been such rains since that time. They fell continuously, day and night, days passing into months, into years, into centuries. They poured into the waiting ocean basins or falling upon the continental masses, drained away to become the sea. That primeval ocean growing in bulk as the rain slowly filled its basins must have been only faintly salt. But the falling rains were the symbol of the dissolution of the continents. From the moment the rain began to fall, the lands began to be worn away and carried to the sea. It is an endless, inexorable process that has never stopped. The dissolving of the rocks, the leaching out of their contained minerals, the carrying of the rock fragments and the dissolved minerals into the ocean, and over the eons of time, the sea has grown ever more bitter with the salt of the continents. In what manner the sea produced the mysterious and wonderful stuff called protoplasm, we cannot say. In its warm, dimly lit waters, the unknown conditions of temperature and pressure and saltiness must have been the critical ones for the creation of life from non-life. At any rate, they produced the result that neither the alchemists with their crucibles nor modern scientists in their laboratories have been able to achieve. Before the first living cell was created, there may have been many trials and failures. It seems probable that within the warm saltiness of the primeval sea, certain organic substances were fashioned from carbon dioxide, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and calcium. Perhaps these were transition steps from which the complex molecules of protoplasm arose. Molecules that somehow acquired the ability to reproduce themselves and begin the endless stream of life. But at present, no one is wise enough to be sure. Those first living things may have been simple microorganisms, rather like some of the bacteria we know today, mysterious borderline forms that were not quite plants, not quite animals, barely over the intangible line that separates the non-living from the living. It's doubtful that this first life possessed the substance chlorophyll with which plants in sunlight transform lifeless chemicals into the living stuff of their tissues. Little sunshine could enter their dim world, penetrating the cloud banks from which fell the endless rains. Mm, probably the sea's first children lived on the organic substances then present in the ocean waters, or like the iron and sulfur bacteria that exists today, live directly on inorganic food. All the while, the cloud cover was thinning, the darkness of the nights alternating with palely illumined days. And finally, the sun for the first time shone through upon the sea. By this time, some of the living things that floated in the sea must have developed the magic of chlorophyll. Now they were able to take the carbon dioxide of the air and the water of the sea and of these elements in sunlight build the organic substances they needed. So the first true plants came into being. Another group of organisms lacking the chlorophyll but needing organic food found they could make a way of life for themselves by devouring the plants. So the first animals arose and from that day to this, every animal in the world has followed the habit it learned in the ancient seas and depends directly or through complex food chains on the plants for food and life. As the years passed and the centuries and the millions of years, the stream of life grew more and more complex from simple one-celled creatures, others that were aggregations of specialized cells arose and then creatures with organs for feeding, digesting, breathing, reproducing. Sponges grew on the rocky bottom of the sea's edge and coral animals 
built their habitations in warm, clear waters. Jellyfish swam and drifted in the sea. Worms evolved and starfish and hard-shelled creatures with many jointed legs. The arthropods, the plants too, progressed from the microscopic algae to branched and curious, curiously fruiting seaweeds that swayed with the tides and were plucked from the coastal rocks by the surf and cast adrift. During all this time, the continents had no life. There was little to induce living things to come ashore. Forsaking their all-providing, all-embracing Mother Sea, the lands must have been bleak and hostile, beyond the power of words to describe. Imagine a whole continent of naked rock, across which no covering mantle of green had been drawn, a continent without soil, and there were no land plants to aid in its formation and bind it to the rock with their roots. Imagine a land of stone, a silent land, except for the sound of the rains and the winds that swept across it. For there was no living voice, no living thing over the surface of the rocks. Meanwhile, the gradual cooling of the planet, which had first given the Earth its hard granite crust, was progressing into deeper layers. And as the interior slowly cooled and contracted, it drew away from the outer shell. This shell, accommodating itself to the shrinking sphere within it, fell into folds and wrinkles and the Earth's first mountain ranges. Geologists tell us that there must have been at least two periods of mountain building, often called revolutions, in that dim period, so long ago that the rocks have no record of it, so long ago that the mountains themselves have long since been worn away. Then there came a third great period of upheaval heaval and readjustment of the Earth's crust, about a billion years ago. But all of its majestic mountains, the only reminders today are the Laurentian Hills of Eastern Canada and a great shield of granite over the flat country around Hudson Bay. The epics of mountain building only served to speed up the processes of erosion by which the continents were worn down and their crumbling rock and contained minerals returned to the sea. The uplifted masses of mountains were prey to the bitter cold of the upper atmosphere and under the attacks of frost and snow and ice, the rocks cracked and crumbled away. The rains beat with greater violence upon the slopes of the hills and carried away the substance of the mountains in torrential streams. There was still no plant covering to modify and resist the powers of the rains. And in the sea, life continued to evolve. The earliest forms have left no fossils by which we can identify them. Probably they were soft-bodied with no hard parts that could be preserved. Then too, the rock layers formed in those early days have since been so altered by enormous heat and pressure under the foldings of the Earth's crust that any fossils they might have contained would have been destroyed. It was not until the Silurian time, some 350 million years ago, that the first pioneers of land crept out on the shore. It was an arthropod, one of the great tribe that later produced crabs and lobsters and insects. It must have been something like a modern scorpion, but unlike some of its descendants, it never wholly suffered the ties that united it to the sea. It lived a strange life, half terrestrial, half aquatic, something like that of the ghost crabs that speed along the beaches even today, now and then dashing into the surf to moisten their gills. Fish, tapered of body and stream molded by the press of running waters, were evolved in Silurian rivers. In times of drought, in the drying pools and lagoons, the shortage of oxygen forced them to develop swim bladders for the storage of air. One form that possessed an air-breathing lung was able to survive the dry periods by burying itself in mud, leaving a passage to the surface 
through which it breathed. It is very doubtful that the animals alone would have succeeded in colonizing the land, for only the plants had the power to bring about the first amelioration of its harsh conditions. They helped make soil of the crumbling rocks, they held back the soil from the rains that would have swept it away, and little by little, they softened and subdued the bare rock, the lifeless desert. We know very little about the first land plants, but they must have been closely related to some of the larger seaweeds that had learned to live in the coastal shallows, developing strengthened stems and grasping root-like holdfasts to resist the drag and the pull of the waves. The mountains that had been thrown up by the Laurentian Revolution gradually wore away. And as the sediments were washed from their summits and deposited on the lowlands, great areas of the continents sank under the land. The seas crept out of their basins and spread over the lands. Life fared well, as was exceedingly abundant in those shallow sunlit seas. But with the later retreat of the ocean water into the deeper basins, many creatures must have been left stranded in shallow landlocked bays. Some of these animals found means to survive on land. The lakes, the shores of the rivers, and the coastal swamps of those days were the testing grounds in which plants and animals either became adapted to new conditions or perished. As the lands rose and the seas receded, a strange fish-like creature emerged on the land. And over the thousands of years, its fins became legs, and instead of gills, it developed lungs. In the Devonian sandstone, this first amphibian left its footprint. On land and sea, the stream of life poured on. New forms evolved. Some old ones declined and disappeared. On land, the mosses and the ferns and the seed plants developed. The reptiles, for a time, dominated the earth. Gigantic, grotesque, and terrifying. Birds learned to live and move in the ocean of air. The first small mammals lurked inconspicuously in hidden crannies of the earth, as though in fear of the reptiles. When they went ashore, the animals that took up a land life carried with them a part of the sea in their bodies, a heritage which they passed on to their children and which even today links each land animal with its origin in the ancient sea. Fish, amphibian and reptile, warm-blooded bird and mammal, each of us carries in our veins a salty stream in which the elements, sodium, potassium, calcium, are combined in almost the same proportions as in seawater. This is our inheritance from the day untold millions of years ago when a remote ancestor, having progressed from the one-celled to the many-celled stage, first developed a circulatory system in which the fluid was merely the water of the sea. In the same way, our lime-hardened skeletons, our heritage from the calcium rich of Cambrian time. Even the protoplasm that streams within each cell of our bodies has the chemical structure impressed upon all living manner when the first simple creatures were brought forth in the ancient sea. And as life itself began in the sea, so each of us begins as an individual life in a miniature ocean within his mother's womb. And in the stages of his embryonic development, repeats the steps by which his race evolved from gill breathing inhabitants of a water world to creatures able to live on the land. Among the land mammals, there was a race of creatures that took to an arboreal existence. Their hands underwent remarkable development, becoming skilled in manipulating and examining objects. And along with this skill became a superior 
brain power that compensated for what these comparatively small mammals lacked in strength. At last, perhaps, somewhere in the vast interior of Asia, they descended from the trees and became again terrestrial. The past million years have seen their transformations into beings with body and the brain and the spirit of man. Eventually, man, too, found his way back to the sea. Standing on its shores, he must have looked out upon it with wonder and curiosity, compounded with an unconscious recognition of his lineage. We could not physically re-enter the ocean as the seals and the whales had done, but over the centuries, with all the skill and ingenuity and reasoning powers of our minds, we have sought to explore and investigate even its most remote parts. We built boats to venture out onto its surface. Later, man found ways to descend to the shallow parts of its floor, carrying with him the air as a land mammal long accustomed to aquatic life he needed to breathe. Moving in fascination over the deep sea he could not enter. He found ways to probe its depths. He let down nets to capture its life. He invented mechanical eyes and ears that could recreate his senses, a world long lost, but a world that in the deepest part of his subconscious mind, he had never wholly forgotten. The sense of all these things come to man most clearly in the course of a long ocean voyage, when he watches day after day the receding rim of the horizon, ridged and furrowed by waves, then at night he becomes aware of the Earth's rotation as the stars pass overhead, or when alone in this world of water and sky, he feels the loneliness of his Earth in space, and then, as never on land, he knows the truth that his world is a water world a planet dominated by its covering mantle of ocean in which the continents are but transient intrusions of land above the surface of the all-encircling sea. <laughs>